going back, picking one up out of the book. I remember singing this one as a little kid growing up in church. Love the words. Would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood. Power in the blood. Would you or evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. In the blood of the Lamb, power, power, wonder, King power, in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be free from your passion and pride? There's power in the blood. a new one. I like the words here too. It goes like this. I'm not a warrior, still afraid to lose. Feel unqualified, what you're calling me to do. Lord, with your strength, I've got no excuse. Broken people are exactly who you use. Took a shepherd boy and made him a king. Gonna trust you, Lord, give you everything. I'll be a conqueror, cause you fight for me. Shake the walls, won't stop Not until I see them all. Stand and stand back when you call Jesus. Jesus, 
sing and shout and shake the walls Won't stop until I see them fall Won't stand up, step up when you call can have a seat this morning. Love those words. Facing our giants. Gary, with confidence, huh? I wonder when I read the stories, you know, some of the folks back in the, in the word there, sometimes it's that first step that's a tough one, right? But doesn't he meet us there? Isn't he awesome? Giving us that strength that we need for the journey. Man. Another one together with us here this morning. <clears throat> Here's one that I had to think really hard about yesterday. <laughs> See how hard I have to think about it today. The song goes like this. I've had, oh, let's try this. I told you I had to think about it. I've had good days. I've had bad days. Tasted victory and defeat. I've had problems, biggest planets, turn to pebbles when you speak. I've had nothing to my name, never lacked for anything, cause you were there with me. Stand before you guilty Oh, your mercy bears my blame When in pride I think I'm worthy You point out the price you pay When I wander far away You keep calling out my name You don't give up on me You've been my savior, sustainer for the truth of those words today, everything we've ever needed, Lord, you've been right there. You're our source, you're our supply, you're the one we put our faith in, our trust in today. Help us grow in that this morning. Lord, as we gather here today and we open up your word again this morning, just pray, God, that you would help us to grow in our knowledge of you. God, that we would not only hear the words today, but we'd be doers of your word as well. God, we give you this week give you this day. Ask you to use each and every moment that we live, every breath that we take to bring glory and honor to you. And Lord, we thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Just one more. Just one more together. Might surprise you. We've been singing this song for a long time. Might surprise you to know that I learned this one wrong. Oh, well. We're singing it with all our heart, right? I'm telling you, you used to get mad. Mike, I did. I'd get mad at Dad for singing songs. You know, he had this great big old voice. 
didn't need a microphone, and he'd usually be singing a different verse than the one I was on. I'd say, come on, Dad, sing with me. <laughs> Sometimes I think he'd learn them a little different than I did. Whatever he sang, we followed him. That's kind of how it worked. But I love these words. It goes, blessed be the name of the Lord. Let's give him all the thanks today. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Continue on through Romans. I'm going to start off with the big concepts that we're in right now. We're going to be in Romans chapter 11, starting at verse 11 through 24. So, Paul speaking to the Roman Christians, which were Jewish, almost all of them. There were some non-Jews among the group that had heard of the Messiah and accepted him. He's speaking to them, and he's at the point in this uh, treatise 
this dissertation where he is explaining to his fellow Jewish people that being Jewish doesn't save you. You need to come to Christ. And so he's already dealt with in the first several chapters the accountability of all people before God as sinners and the need for a Savior. Then he has laid out who that Savior is, and it's not Abraham, and it's not the Jewish people. It is Christ himself revealed as the Messiah. He further is pointing out to them that the Jews as a whole at that point in time and subsequent have rejected the Messiah because they were looking for a different kind of Messiah. They were looking for a political Messiah. They were looking for somebody to save the Jews but nobody else as far as they were concerned. And this has leaked into today's Christian movement where there is a love for Jewish people and a hatred for Arab Muslim people. Jesus never did that, ever. And somehow we need to get that off of the table. And that's what Paul's trying to do. So he's, he's at the point of discussing, saying, okay, the Jews were part of the plan, right? Right. But some of the branches were broken off because of unbelief, right? Right. Then Paul says, now I wish, my brethren, because I'm a Jew of Jews, I'm a Pharisee, I'm of the right tribe, I have the right background, I have zeal, I have everything until I came to Christ and realized I had nothing apart from him. And so my heart and my hope for my fellow countrymen, my fellow group of Jewish believers, is that they would come to the Messiah and find him. Then he laid out a problem last week, and he said, but God has hardened their heart, and we discussed the problem with that because God doesn't cause them to be unbelievers. He takes their unbelief and allows it to take its full run. So we found in the Pharaoh, five times it says, Pharaoh hardened his heart. Five times it says, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Which one is right? Both. Did, did God make Judas a betrayer? No, he was already a traitor. He simply used that. And then he, he tries to zoom out and say, so my Jewish brothers and sisters who have not accepted Christ, see that God is doing something bigger. See that he is the potter and we are the clay. And if he makes vessels of destruction, then who are we to say anything about it? If he makes vessels of honor, who are we to say anything about it? He says, right now, there has been a temporary blindness, in part, among the Jews. It's called a veil. The veil, like Moses wore, it separated the, the glory of God radiating from him from the people. There was the veil in the temple that was roughly six inches thick and very, very tall. And that was the dividing point. It blocked from view the holy of holies from the outside who could not enter in because of their sin. And then we understand even more that this veil that has been placed upon the Jews is Christ himself. Right now, he is the blinder because they're not looking for him as he truly is. They're looking for him as they want him to be. And there will come a day when the gospel will be heard by a group. I think it's over all of time myself. I don't think it's a particular event. Uh, there may be times where the volume's turned up a little bit louder and the hearing's a little bit clearer. But uh, it, it, it's only going to come when the gospel is heard and received, plain and simple. So that's where we are. So the question that, that Paul asked at this point is, then are the Jewish people doomed forever? Before I give you some notes, one more piece of history. Especially between World War I and II and Nazism and all that happened, fascism, Mussolini, and on and on and on, all of that stuff. Even in most Christian churches, Jewish people were hated for one reason. They had been taught that the Jews killed Jesus. But who really killed Jesus? 
all of us. We are all accountable. They may have been used within history as individual people, but it was not every single Jew that killed Jesus, right? Nicodemus came to know Christ, and others did too. We know that. So we're talking in generalities here. And what happened in the church for a good deal of time because of the new theology that entered in during the 1900s, late 1800s, and on and on, basically they became an object of ridicule from everybody, including the church. They're the killers. They need to be exterminated. Do you understand that it was the Christians in Germany who allowed Hitler to come to power? You understand it was the church that allowed all of that to take place with blessings until they started getting killed. And then they started realizing who this guy really is. So here's the question. Number one, has God abandoned all Jews because of their rejection of the Messiah as a whole? No. Nicodemus is a, is a, a is an exception. Saul, who became Paul, is an exception. Peter, all of the early disciples were Jewish men who came and women who were disciples of Christ. They found the Messiah. They were Jewish by heritage, by history, by lineage, and yet they became the real Israel of God as they came to the Messiah. So before I give you the next bullet, two more terms that I'm going to keep throwing out. We need to distinguish between Jerusalem, which is below, that's earth, and Jerusalem, which is above, the heavenly Jerusalem. One is of the spirit, one is of the flesh, and that's the terminology that Paul uses over and over again. The Israel of God is made up of born-again believers in the Messiah, whether Jew, Gentile, male, female, slave, or free, in Christ there is no difference. And we keep, all too often in the church, keep turning back to spiritual, to Israel of the flesh, Israel below. And so that's what we keep hearing over and over and over from churches. We keep hearing it from different leaders and preachers and teachers. We need to pray for the peace of Jerusalem over in Israel. Well, um, more than half of the Jewish people in the world don't live there. In fact, almost half of them live here. So what are we supposed to do with them? Does that mean that they have to live in the city? You see what happens when we start taking things literally, geographically, and we're not understanding. There is, as Paul has said more than once already, there is Israel of the flesh. What good does it do to be a circumcised Jew? Nothing is his answer. You must be circumcised of the heart of stone by the Spirit of God. You must be born again and be circumcised spiritually. It does you no good to be a historic of the world, of the flesh, down below. It serves no purpose for salvation. And the church is getting very confused on that. And I addressed that about three weeks ago. I said, here's the mistake that they're making, and here's the mistake we're making. So if you keep your notes, go back and look at the mistakes. So what is going on here? What is going on? Here's the verse. We start with 11. I say then, have they stumbled collectively that they should fall? God forbid. That's his answer. Have they stumbled that they should fall and not ever be in God's graces ever again? He said, God forbid. But rather through their fall, salvation is come unto the Gentiles. And this is a piece of character of God using human language that we don't usually think of. God provoking the Jews to jealousy because of us. We just don't think of it that way. That's the language he's using. Now, don't take that jealousy and turn it into human jealousy because it's different things, okay? I remember Alfred told me a few years ago, he said, you know, the more I study my own history, he'll be quick to tell you I'm not Navajo, I'm Hopi. I'm married to a Navajo, but we're the real Indians. <laughs> And I just have to laugh because the more he learns about Christ, the more he's understanding, who cares? It doesn't matter. 
He said, but here's what I've had to learn, and I learned it from John Wayne also. If the Christian faith had not come into this country the way it did, I'd be lost. There would be no Jesus in my life, my people's life. None of the, none of the tribes would have Jesus. He said, so you got to thank God that some people came in, declared manifest destiny, because otherwise we would have never heard the gospel. And he said, as much as I hated boarding school and all of the stuff that that was all about and what it did to people and how it beat them down, he said, nevertheless, I still kept hearing the gospel. I was hearing it more in human terms, more in earthly language, but when I began to hear it from the Spirit, I get it. And then the next step was, as Cheryl asked me years ago, I have a problem. When I die, am I going to be resurrected in Navajo? Or and I said, well, I don't think you're going to be resurrected white. I doubt it. And she smiled and she said, I said, Cheryl, you are you because God made you that. He placed you in that place in that time. Did anybody here place your order for who you were before you were born? Of course not. God says, I'm going to make of my kingdom. It'll be of all languages, all tongues, all ethnicities across time. I will draw those who come to the cross. That's my people. That's the Jerusalem coming down from heaven. Not an event, not a thing, but over time, God's Jerusalem in heaven becomes us adorned as a bride because we're the bride of Christ. So Paul keeps going through this thing. He says, has God abandoned all Jews everywhere for eternity because they're the killers? That was the conclusion of Christians in America not too long after the 19, early 1900s. That was the conclusion. They're bad people. They killed Jesus. First bullet, God has not condemned all Jews to eternal lies, loss. Rather, God has used Gentiles, that's everybody other than them, that's us, has used Gentiles to provoke Israel of the flesh to turn to the Messiah Jesus so that they could become Israel of the Spirit, the Jerusalem of God. Now, if the fall of them, next verse, be riches of the world, and the diminishing of them, riches of the Gentile, how much more their fullness? Let's try to put that in English. If it hurt really bad when they fell away from the Messiah, what's going to happen when they turn back to him? It's going to be such a big eye-opener that how, did, how, how was the Messiah missed when he came here? How did our ancestors miss him? Could they not see clearly that he was God in the flesh? Could they not see clearly his love for them and for us? And the answer is no, they couldn't, because they were hardened in their heart, looking for their own kind of God, their own kind of Messiah. For I speak to you Gentiles, now he's talking to us, okay? He's been talking to them, now he's talking to us. For I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am an apostle of the Gentiles. In other words, without Paul being sent to give the saving message to the Gentiles, we too would be lost, just like Alfred said, I would be lost too. If other people hadn't come in my life and said, you know, you may not like that I threw you in school and took your land and did this, but you found Jesus. Wow, what a hard pill to swallow. What a hard pill to swallow. If by any means I may, Paul the apostle to the Gentiles being a Jew, that I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh and might save some of them. So what can we say about that? Even today, Israel of the flesh must turn in saving faith to the cross of Jesus for salvation. There is no other way. But that's not what's being taught today. 
We're being taught that Jerusalem, we need to pray for the peace of Jerusalem, and God loves the Jews. He's going to save them all. They're all going to wake up one day, and they're going to rebuild a temple and reinstitute a sacrifice. Are you kidding me? What Bible are we reading? This is coming from church people, Christian people. I know I was raised that way. So were most of you. You mean there will be a rebuilt temple when Jesus said, I'll never, ever dwell in temples made by hands again? You mean you're going to sacrifice to God when the Lamb of God has been slain at the Passover? There is no more Passover. There, no, there is no more sacrifice. Christ is the That's it. It's done. How did we get our theology so goofed up? Well, you already know most of my opinions, but I'll keep going, okay? Because <laughs> it's the undoing of my own thinking to go back and say, that doesn't make sense. It's not what I'm hearing the Bible teach at all. There is no other name given under heaven whereby men must be saved. You can't say, but I'm a circumcised Jew. I'm saved. It's not what it said. But I'm a, but I'm a, but I'm a, no, that's not what it says. There's no other name given under heaven, Jesus Christ, whereby men must be saved. There's no other way. There is no other way. So Romans 15, if the casting away of them, small group, be the reconciling of the whole world, whoever believes shall not perish but have everlasting life, if it takes the destruction of a few to save the masses, then that's just kind of how it works in a fallen world. It said, if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall be the receiving of them but life from the dead? They were dead to the Messiah, dead to Christ. They discovered the cross. They heard the gospel. They turned their life to Christ. Wherever they may be, it has nothing to do with being in Jerusalem, being in Israel, wherever they may be. And I remember back at my dad's funeral, and I helped share that service with uh, his pastor and another. And I had my good friend David Cohen there because almost all my friends were Jewish growing up. And they had all been to kibbutz. They would all been to Israel. They, that was their to take the pilgrimage and all that. And at my dad's funeral in front of everybody, I saw David. I said, David, you, you know, we've been best buddies forever. I hope you can find the Jesus I found. And I wish I could go back and undo some of your behavior. I taught you. What a good teacher I was. I made all of us rascals. I wish I could undo all of that. And I wish you could hear Jesus loves you. That's about all I could say at that point. Because I could see him. I could see him. Anytime that conversation ever came up, it was the hardening of the heart. It was the not going to go there. What are we talking about that for? Jesus stands ready to receive all who come to him with a broken and a contrite heart. Jew, Gentile, male, female, slave, free. There is no difference in Christ. Therefore, in Christ there is no condemnation. If you come to him, it doesn't matter where you've come from. There is no condemnation. If you come with a broke, what, what's the biblical word for broken and contrite heart? Repentance. That's all it is. It's a broken and a contrite heart before God that I have not heard your voice before. And I'm hearing for the first time the message of the love of God through the cross of Christ and the death for my sin. And that breaks me before God because I know my sin destroyed him on the cross. I know that he died for me. That's repentance. And then by faith, I accept what he did, and I go forward from that point. And today, we want faith without broken and contrite heart. I want to skip that part. Can we just have the happy Jesus and keep living the way I want? You see the problem we're in socially right now? We all have lifestyles that have pieces that need to not be there. That's not God's way. All of us do. But until we come with that broken, not to be saved again, but there still needs to be the continual 
brokenness and contriteness that God, no matter how, I have an answer to you of why I'm doing that right now. He doesn't want to hear your reasons. He doesn't want to hear your excuse. You, I know them all, by the way. <laughs> Most of you do too. It's not negotiable. God just says, come to me in brokenness and contrition. I'm on your side. I oppose all who have a proud heart, who don't listen to me. I oppose them. Even my own kids, I oppose them. So one more story while I'm thinking of it. I will never forget one of the biggest lessons in my life. I was working with my dad, had a business. He had five stores at the time. Beck was working there. Sister was working there. Other sister was working there, the whole family. And I was having a little bit of a run-in with one of the employees, and I had been part of setting up stores and doing layouts and all of that and also discovering Beck along the way. We worked together for seven years before the light clicked. We got to a point where there was a lot of ill will at work. And so if you need to learn this lesson, learn it well. I did. Came to my dad and said, Dad, either he goes or I go. And he said, see you later. <laughs> what a smack in the face. I needed that one really. because Yeah, I, of the four kids, I was the one that was going to finish school. And he, he told me, he said, when you get your diploma, you'll be a 50-50 partner. And he threw some numbers out and said, how would you like to start out that salary? And I went, you mean there's numbers that big, right? Okay. Uh, and that's what I was working toward. And when I graduated, um, Dad said, see you later because we're going to seminary. And he said, we knew. We knew. We knew before you did. We knew before you did that you and Beck were going to get married. She was already a daughter to us. Do not provoke God because he might just say, see you later. You know, you can do what you want, but I'm not doing it that way. Big lesson. Second part, because of unbelief, some of the branches, the branches of Israel of the flesh, the branches of Jerusalem below, the branches of historic Israel, all the way back to Abraham through Moses, David, the prophets, etc., because of unbelief, some branches connected to God through the old covenant were broken off because of unbelief. We don't know how many were cast aside. They were broken because they were dead. They were cast aside. What was going to be the final outcome of those broken off dead branches? They're going to be burned in the fire. Now, they never were, but there will be a group that will be because of unbelief. Others, because of the covenant of new grace, of God's grace, discovered a way out of their unbelief. Okay, so what does that mean going forward? There were some connected through the old covenant because of their unbelief, their unbelief in Abraham, their unbelief in Moses, their unbelief in David, their unbelief in the prophets, their unbelief in the Messiah when he came. They were broken off because they just simply would not hear. And God said, you are a stubborn, stiff-necked, obstinate, deaf people. You don't listen to anything I tell you. You keep saying yes, yes, and you go off and do whatever you want. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to cast you off because you cast me off. And I'm going to make of a people that are not my people, I'm going to make them into my people. And you who were my people because you've cast me off, you're not my people anymore. Understand how the earthly covenants work. When you disobey, you forfeit the land. It doesn't matter that you took the Gaza or the East Bank or West Bank. or the, None of that matters. That is stuff going on that we are jazzing up all over the place and reading into it what all is going on. These are unbelievers that are throwing Christians out of their home. And they did that to almost 10,000 homes when Israel was declared a nation back in 47, 48. First thing they did is went in with bulldozers to the Palestinian Christian community and leveled the whole thing and threw them out and said, now it's your turn to be wanderers. These are the believers. What do you think God thinks of that? And then they confiscated the best houses and just said, just like the Nazis did, in your house anymore, it's ours. 
that's, we don't hear that part of the story. We just don't hear that part of the story. Yeah, but they're Jews and God loves them. Well, they're acting like unbelievers. Oh, well, because they are. They need Jesus. They need the gospel. They don't need the Gaza or the West Bank or this or that. We are basically encouraging them to steal stuff. Yeah, but they're supposed to get from, from they're supposed to get Arab Israel. I'd love to do a four hour coffee with any of you on that one. It's not what you keep hearing. The river is not the Nile. It is under Solomon. All of that was fulfilled. Every bit of it's been fulfilled. Then what are we looking forward to? We are like Abraham who all die without having received the promises because we are looking for a city whose maker and builder is God. It's not of this world. We've somehow got to separate that out, and we're not, we're not there yet by any means. Okay, so if they're broken off for unbelief, the question Paul asks is, what if they turn to Christ? Can they be put back onto the tree? He gives a really good answer. And if the first fruit be holy, and what is the first fruit? The first fruit is the first century church of Jewish people who accepted the Messiah. If that first fruit be holy, then the lump is also holy. And if the root be holy, connected to Christ, so will be the branches. The key is to be connected to Christ. And if some of the branches be broken off, and thou being a wild olive, you remember he's talking to the Gentiles, we're the wild, the wild bunch, we're the wild tree. The wild olive tree were grafted in among them. And what's the sign of a good graft on a tree? You can't find it. Because it looks like it was always there. It's easy to pick a bad graft. Kind of like a bone that was broken, never set. I've got one for reasons that I chose. But you know it was broken. You can't hide it. When Christ grafts anybody into his body, there is no Jew or Gentile, no male or female, no slave or free. Everybody is equal. Everybody is part of the body. And they are living stones placed where God has placed them. We don't ask where to be. Hey, I want to be a stone in the living room. Why'd you put me back there with the toilet? Well, because I needed you back there. He puts us where he wants us. And if we start talking back to the potter, then we need to, we need to pay attention. Boast not against the branches. Why is verse 18 so important? Because of what I told you about Christian history in this country and in Europe, especially between the two great wars. The church was part of the persecution of all Jews because they were the killers. And the church promoted Nazism more than we would want to know. Because they, the language kept being, you know, it sounded so good. And, you know, we're going we're gonna to give you everything. You don't have to go to work anymore. We're going to send you payments. Are we hearing familiar language yet? We are. If some of the branches be broken off, and you being a wild olive tree were grafted in among them, and with them partakers of the root and fatness of the olive tree, boast not against the branches, but if you boast, you bearest not the root. You're not connected to Jesus is the vine. We are the branches. That's what the root is, okay? The vine, the, the base. If we boast that Jesus loves me, but hates the Jews. He says, you're not part of my root. And if we do the opposite, well, let's just, I'll share this story one more time because some of you haven't heard it. When we lived in East Texas, we had a big hedge in the front of our house, and I went and I trimmed it down, and I left all the branches lying on the ground, and I was going to come back later and pick them up except my older daughter beat me to it. And she started picking up the cut branches and replanting them in the hedge. And I didn't know it till like a week later, all these branches are dying. And I re 
that's where all my cut branches went. She stuck them back in the plant. I thought she'd gathered them up and hauled them off out in the woods or something like that. Over time, the cut branches show up because they dry and the leaves fall off. And it was pretty comical to see that she had done that. Well, I don't remember what the reason was. It was fun, I guess. Here's what we need to know then. First bullet, God allowed the Jews, Israel of the flesh, the Jerusalem below. He allowed them to stumble and fall. He didn't make them stumble and fall. He allowed them to stumble and fall on Jesus in unbelief so that you and I could be saved. Wow, isn't that a plan that nobody saw coming? Verse 19, 20, 21 then. Will you then say the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in? Well, because of unbelief they were broken off. Not because they were the killers, not because they were, it's because they had rejected God in in whole. And you stand by faith. Now here's the warning. Be not high-minded, but fear. We walk by faith, not by sight. If we start getting proud about our faith, I'm a, I'm a kid of the king and I can get whatever I want because I'm special. And then, uh, like my dad said, then just leave. <laughs> okay? I'm not going to fire the other guy. You're the one that needs to go. You're the one with the problem, not him. And w- wow, what an eye opener that was. If God spared not the natural branches, take heed, lest he not spare you. Now, I also want to give some assurance in that stern warning. If you belong to Christ, he is able to save you completely. Just be really careful with your attitude because it's out there. It is is way out there. Christians walking with pride in the world, claiming and proclaiming and decreeing and declaring and prophesying 99% wrong all the time and have no qualms about it whatsoever. Every time they write a new book about the end, it's always wrong. That's the one thing I can say I've learned in 40 years is end timers have been wrong every single time. I suspect they will always be wrong because they're missing the whole point in the first place. Why are we listening to them? Joe points out over in Deuteronomy, he says, if a prophet stands up and speaks something and it doesn't come to pass, stop listening to him. Just stop listening to him. So, next bullet for us. We, the wild, <laughs> that's not beaches, okay? If you get, go to the beach and get wild, that's something different, okay? Branches, correct that. <laughs> Whoa, the wild beaches, Okay. Uh, We, the wild branches, spelled differently, autocorrect, of course, who are grafted into the tree should not look down upon unbelieving Israel. Rather, we should stand in awe and trembling that God has spared us. And we might add to that, not only don't look down on unbelieving Israel, but don't look down on unbelievers. They need the gospel. Were we all not once upon a time unbelievers? then we need to remember that. So there are still circles of Christians who are looking down their nose or keeping their chin up around other people because they're special. They're special only. The only thing special about me is I I had God save me through the cross of Calvary. That's it. We need to know that. We need to understand that. Let's look at the third part, and hopefully this broadens our understanding of what is going on because it is not what's being taught. And I would, I really, I really think we're up to about three out of four churches today. It's that high percentage that, in my view, have it plain old wrong because they're not studying the Bible. They're studying timelines and charts, and this guy said that, and that guy said that. And, and I've played that game. I've played that game for many decades before I realized that's what it is. It's a game. How many times does somebody have to be wrong before you stop listening to them? It took a long time to figure that one out. 
God's sovereign plan included a much larger olive tree. Still an olive tree, but it has wild branches grafted in. That's all of us. It has original branches that came to the Messiah. That would be Nicodemus and Paul and Peter and all the other disciples and the Old Testament people of faith that were looking forward to the Messiah. We're looking backward. God always has a bigger thing going on. And the mistake all too often of the church today is to start interpreting stuff in the here and now, in the temporal, in the geography of today, and in the flesh. Big mistake of biblical interpretation. God is always pointing to something bigger and greater. Jesus pointed away from the temple. He pointed away from Jerusalem. He pointed his disciples to the Samaritans, to the uttermost part. He, he pointed them away from their history and who they were as a historic people and said, God's doing something much bigger than that. In their view, the Messiah was only to save the Jews. That's it. That's it. They could care less about you and me. God's sovereign plan included a much larger olive tree than Israel of the flesh could ever anticipate. And in my estimation, it's being confused today in many, many churches. We're doing the geographic thing. We're doing the in, in this time and space thing. We're missing the bigger picture. The king of peace has come. And he wants peace in his Jerusalem. And you only have peace in Jerusalem when you have the king of peace. So the geography has nothing to do with it. So to pay, pray for the peace of Jerusalem is to pray for the unity and peace of the body of Christ under the lordship of the king of peace. And we're not doing that. We're getting divided over things that the enemy's having a heyday because we're just not paying much attention for some reason. Behold, therefore, wow, this is a statement. This verse just sticks out of Romans like a sore thumb. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fell, severity, unbelief, but thee toward thee, goodness, if you continue in his goodness, Otherwise, you shall be cut off. Now, what's he talking about? Do we have to save ourselves through belief? No, he's saying be really careful that if you continue in goodness, it's the goodness of his grace through faith. The minute you throw away the cross and you start taking it upon yourself in your own deeds, in your own, that's what Israel of the flesh was doing over and over again. He said you'll be cut off too. Over in Hebrews, he, when we get to Hebrews, talks about falling from grace. He's not talking about being unsaved. He's talking about trying to be saved by something other than grace. That answers that very difficult verse. First bullet, because of the judgment of unbelieving Israel of the flesh, the Gentiles, the pagans, the unbelievers, the, un, the non-Jews, were given access to the cross of salvation. Did all Gentiles take that access no, and that's who we are still reaching out to. Anybody who does not know Christ, that is who needs to hear the gospel, no matter who and where they are. Next verse. And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, they come to Christ. If they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. He's the God of miracles and the resurrection. He can take a dead branch laying on the ground, unlike me. I had to take mine that Danny stuck back in the bush and throw them away and burn them because that's where they were going to go in the first place. He can stick them back in and they'll grow again. Whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's what he's talking about. Not Jewishness, not Gentileness. Is there a word Gentile? There is now. God is able to graft back into the olive tree all unbelieving Jews who turn to Jesus in saving faith. Not because of Abraham, not because of Moses, not because of their history, not because of anything. Because they also, 
have a broken and a contrite heart before their creator and they accept Jesus for the Messiah that he has always been, the lamb slain from before the foundation of the world. He's always been that. He's always been the solution. And whoever turns to the solution gets salvation, eternal life. So it's not hard for God to pick up those, as my friend David and the many others, My hope is that one of these days, not knowing it till we get there, that some of my Jewish friends finally accepted Christ. Did have one guy down the street, and I told you about him last week. Um, he accepted Christ, and his parents put his name in the obituary the next day and disowned him. He was just a young teenager. Wow, what do you do with that? The Lord took care of him, though. He kept growing in his faith, as far as I know. <clears throat> If you who were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these, which be the natural branches, grafted into their own olive tree? You come to the cross and you can be grafted in. When any unbelieving Jew surrenders their life to the Messiah, Jesus, they are grafted back into the olive tree. Who is Jesus? He's the vine. He's the root. Honest. The more, the more I accept what Paul is saying, apart from our own local politics and national politics, the more I get upset at what we're doing as a country. We are funding a bunch of thugs and don't know it. Hmm. And being good Americans, we fund both sides of all issues, right? That's how the world works. Why are we surprised? So somehow, for me, coming out of uh, the pandemic once again, as we are going through books doctrinally, it just keeps raising the same issue. Just return back to what you've always known about this. Stop listening to all, just stop. It doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. If you have opportunity to say, to, to share with an unbeliever about the love of Christ and the problem of sin, do it. That's what's needed. Whoever it is can be grafted in, can be grafted in. But do not make the mistake that all church people are saved. Do not make the mistake that Jews are saved just because they're Jewish. Do not make the mistake that the Jews need Jerusalem and kick all the other people out because that's what they're trying to do. And there is the temple fund, and it's not of God. I, that I'm pretty sure of. And in Texas, they're trying to breed the red heifer so they can reinstitute the sacrifice. That's not of God. I can be sure of that because Jesus is the sacrifice lamb. You see what's clouding everything? All of that is religious stuff. It's it's. Basically, heresy is what it really is. It's false teaching and false prophecy, and I've been fed that my whole life, and I want desperately to get out of it and just get back to the basis of the blood of the Lamb. That's a good place to be. Aren't you glad you got grafted in? We didn't displace anybody, okay? People weren't thrown out so that I could take their place and they could never return. A brand new spot was made for me. A brand new spot was made for you. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that you love us so much and that you have given us your written word so that we can see a bigger picture of what you have always been doing, redeeming lost, fallen mankind because of sin. We get so tangled up in the here and now. We have, we have all developed to one degree or another COVID brain and, and we're just not thinking clear and we're not, we've, we've just been messed with. And so many people have been changed socially, they'll never go back. And there will be certain practices and behaviors that may be okay, maybe not, maybe it doesn't matter. But again, the point is we're being conformed to this world, and we're not supposed to be conformed to this world, but be transformed. And the more we get transformed, 
the more we understand that this world is never on our side. It's never for us. And our job is to be ambassadors for Christ. Our job is to come to the cross and bring people to come with us, make that invitation. Father, help us to rethink through our own faith over and over again as we turn to Scripture repeatedly. In Jesus' name, amen. One more song, guys. Stand with us. We'll sing it together. <clears throat> Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace inspired me is really how precious did that grace appear. Yeah.